So it's just been a weird spring so far. It was an early spring, and I thought, boy, you know, it was so nice and early ice out, mild winter. And then, you know, you look through May, big parts of April, it was just cool. I remember the water temperatures across the board in the upper Midwest, anyways, just seemed to hang between 40 and 50 degrees forever. And then just like that, they bump from 50 to 60 degrees, just a really a, a strange spring. And so the water's warmed up dramatically here over the last 10 days. But what's amazing to me is that we had a major cold front come through. Water temperatures are still hanging in the mid 50s, low 60s. And so we're gonna go out, classic post-spawn walleyes. We're in Western Minnesota, just bumping around with some small lakes here in that Detroit Lakes area. You know, over the years we've, uh done a lot of panfish shows, a lot of crappie, a lot of bluegill, and even some bass shows in this area. But I was excited when uh, Jason reached out and asked about, uh, you know, the walleye fishing in this area. To me, the walleye fishing is, you know, really one of the most underrated or underutilized uh, fish in this area. We've got a lot of lakes and a lot of walleyes. And, you know, it seems that, you know, panfish seem to be king a lot of times in the winter, but this open water season, especially early in the year and late in the fall, there's some phenomenal opportunities for walleye fishing. And so today we're gonna to go out on the structure, we're gonna side image it, look for these breaks, look for these sand breaks with cabbage, and we're just gonna slip bobber, which is just a really a deadly effective presentation, regardless of where you find walleyes. So we're just going along here, look at that eight to 10 foot transition, you just see this, there's some weeds starting to come up off the bottom. The down view is really crucial for looking at the weeds. I mean, you really get some clarity, but we're just going along, we're just trying to find some just some scattered clumps of cabbage that's starting to grow up in here. Oh, right here, right here. Got him. <laughs> this is fun. I never get tired of that. This is a good one here, Tony. Oh, good. <laughs> you know, it's that time of year, too, where they just fight hard. They're just strong fish. Beauty. There we go. Thank you, sir. Bring them right up to me there. Tell you what, a lot of times you think of it's Detroit Lakes area and you think of panfish but or bass, but there are some great walleye lakes in this area as well. I think the neat thing or the unique thing about this part of the world is this water is so clear that really affects how you fish. Since these fish will still be shallow, but goodness, you can see down to the bottom. It's nothing to see down eight, nine, ten feet of water. I guarantee you if this wind wasn't blowing, if we didn't have this overcast, you could see the bottom. And despite that, a lot of times you'll still find these fish shallow. You know, and another thing that is pretty cool about this area, Jason, you know, we have over 400 lakes within, I think, 15 or 20 miles of downtown Detroit Lakes. So it's a place that, you know, if you get into some fish or if maybe you go try a lake and you're, you're striking out or you're not getting into them, it's easy to hop over to another lake, give it a different, you know, different look. Sometimes, you know, just being mobile and hopping around, you can really do well too. Oh, there we go. Bobber's down. That's your classic walleye bite. There, nice fish. Nice fish. What do you got there? I don't know. Definitely uh, got some fight to him. Oh, yeah, nice man. walleye. Nice walleye. All right. Here. He sure doesn't like the boat. Oh, this is fun. Water is so clear. Swing him out. Oh, look at that. Oh. All right, nice work. That's a beautiful fish, Tony. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that is what we're here for, huh? Dandy. That is what we're here for. Yeah, that's a... Healthy fish. Nice work. Woo! <laughs> Get a little bit of chop out here too. These slip <laughs> poppers are starting to dance a little bit. That's good. 
All right, let's go get another one. You know, the thing about slip bobber fishing is that you're stationary in a, in a spot and you're trying to pick the spot on the spot, but you need these fish to come through. And a lot of times, you know, we'll even use a live site where we can, you know, try to see fish swimming by, but it's hard to chase an individual fish. And so you see a fish swim by, it's not like you can throw your slip bobber ahead of the fish sometimes and catch it. Usually what we're trying to use that for is see the speed that the fish are traveling and the direction that they're coming from. And what you'll see is a pattern. And what's amazing is how fast these fish will move through. And so one thing I like to do is I like to just settle down in an area and just see how many bites do I get in an hour? How many fish do I catch in an hour? If I can catch two or three fish in an hour and get, just get a, a good wave or two of fish that come underneath my, my location every hour, that's going to add up to a great day of fishing because, you know, these fish, it's almost like they're just swimming back and forth. They might have a 200 foot zone you know, a 200 foot contour that they're swimming up and down. And you know what, you catch fish, they swim off. Guess what, half an hour later, those same fish are swimming right back underneath you. And so you can try to chase them around, but I find what works the best is just sitting there and letting them come to you. And so that's why slip bobber fishing can be so effective, especially when you have weeds, is that you can keep your presentation out of the weeds and just hanging in a zone. And those fish, every fish that comes by is gonna to try to eat it. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> I heard that drag feeling. Yeah. yeah, this fish just feels heavy. Oh, I see a little bit of gold. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Dandy. Oh, come here. He doesn't like the boat. No, none of them do. <laughs> This time of year, boy, they, these fish just are just strong. Oh, yeah, that is that a beautiful oh, boy? Oh, then I water? missed him. <laughs> One more chance. Maybe. There we go. Oh, All there right. you go. Look hey, at how long you, that fish you. is. Yeah, that, that makes a person's night, huh? And right now, you know, we're dealing with a, a cold front where it's probably not even 50 degrees, the water's warmer than the air. Just a, oh, look at that, right on the, oh, look at that. Hook popped out in the net. Get a hook out there. Look at that. That is just a great walleye. Look at that. I'm gonna get her in the water here right away. That is just beautiful. I'll show you here what I'm doing. This is something I do on Devil's Lake a lot too, but I'm using braided line for my slip bobbers, which is pretty unusual, I think, at least outside of Devil's Lake, but putting 14 pound power pro on that spool, the reason I'm using that heavier power pro is that bobber stop will grip to it a lot better. And what I'm doing on the bobber stop, what I do is I do two bobber stops back to back. That'll grip it a lot better and cinch it up on that 14 pound power pro and then you blow the power pro, just got a little egg weight and a swivel, then that's just my fluorocarbon leader. I'm just using a 12 pound test fluorocarbon leader with just a small live bait hook. But the reason I like to use that, that braid is that it'll last all summer. I mean, you just replace your snails. I mean, it just, it's just bulletproof. And it just really works effective, especially for setting the hook and those bobbers get away from the boat. Just, I find that it works way better than monofilament. You know, one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot too is using our electronics. And typically, you know, on a, on a normal year and a normal day, I'd be out here casting swim baits, maybe even throwing some shallow diving crankbaits just to try to locate fish. And then I might set up my slip bobber. But we are in some serious post cold front conditions. I mean, we've had a 35 degree swing in just a day and a half. And, you know, the water temp hasn't really dropped a whole lot, but what we're needing to do is we're really using this side scan and we're paying attention to our electronics. You know, I know Jason had mentioned earlier that we're, we're scanning and we're seeing the stands of cabbage, but what we're needing to do is just slow down our presentation. You know, these fish aren't real active. They're not gonna come chasing after a swim bait. They're not gonna come chasing after maybe even a crankbait of sorts, but uh, we're just putting our slip bobber out. We're setting it so it kind of skims right over the top of the cabbage and we're just being patient, letting the bleach and bobber do their, do their thing. And uh, you know, giving it 20 minutes, half hour. If we aren't finding fish, then we'll use the electronics, scan down for some more stands of cabbage and just get in there and be patient. You know, that's one of the biggest things you can do when you're facing, you know, tougher conditions. 
There we go. Oh, I just want to see it and hold it in my hands. This is not a walleye. I think I know what it is. <laughs> Come over here. I think we know what this is. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. nice fish. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we have a little bit too small of a net. Yeah, we'll see if we can just unhook them next to the boat. Yeah. That was about 10 years ago or so when this area really blew up and kind of got put on the musky world. Well, with fish like that, you can see why. Yeah. Oh, come on. Oh yeah, I'm seeing nice some musky. color. That's a nice musky. Yeah, he's, a, he's all mid 40s. But here's something to talk about too, you know, in the sense that, you know, people that are out here fishing for muskies, they're gonna take care of them. They're gonna have bolt cutters, they're gonna have a big net. They're gonna get them out of the water, back in the water. But, you know, if you're out here bass fishing, walleye fishing, whatever, and you happen to get one of these on, I guess what you call accidentally or incidentally, chances are you're gonna have a too small of a net, you're gonna have light lines, you're gonna wear out the fish. So I think you have to be extra careful. Take even more precautions. Or these fish are going to be more tired. Look at that. That's a good fish. Oh, that was close. That's all right. We'll take our time. We're, she's not quite ready yet. I might have to get by here, Tony. Okay, I'm gonna get 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 my up there. Go 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 go. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I knew we were kind of on borrowed time. Yeah. Eight yep. pound fluorocarbon leader. Oh well, it was fun to see. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> The whole system with slip bobbering is pretty simple in the sense that you obviously don't need a very expensive rod in the sense that you're not using the rod for sensitivity. And so the biggest thing is just to lengthen the action. Don't be afraid to use a longer rod. This is just a walleye series rod from Shields. Phenomenal multi-purpose rod if you need a, a seven to seven and a half foot rod, medium light action for live bait rigging, slip bobber, or even pitching cranks. I like that longer action just for lobbing bait without losing your bait. Remember too with the reel, when you're setting the hook, don't be afraid to set the hook with the reel. And since that bobber goes down, just crank on that reel handle until that rod starts to load up. When you start to feel that rod tip load up, that's when you sweep and set the hook. And so, otherwise you're going to swing and miss at a lot of fish. And so, 14 pound braid with that 8 pound fluorocarbon leader. Now, I'll show you my tackle box here real quick. For just a slip bobber tackle box, things you need to have. Obviously, an assortment of slip bobbers, a lot of one inch, inch and a quarter slip bobbers. A lot of small egg weights or worm weights, especially if you're using a plain hook. But the other thing I do a lot of is these Whistler jigs and these small fireball jigs. And what I find early on in the year, especially with these fronts, you know, I'll use a plain hook a lot. You know, the air temperatures dropped 20, 25 degrees in the last couple of days. And so when things get tough, cold fronts, go plain, keep it simple. But especially later on in the summer, that water warms up, a lot of times just a fireball hook or a Whistler jig. Just add a little bit of flash, a little bit of color. But tell you what, this is stuff that you can go out and do. And if you have kids, families, whatever, you can come out here. The more people in the boat, the better, because you could use more rods and just come out here and catch a lot of fish. This is something that'll catch walleyes anywhere. I mean, it's just so effective. If you know where fish are, especially if there's stumps, trees, weeds, rocks, and you can just sit in a small spot, you let that leech swim in front of a walleye, they just can't resist it. You know, this area that we're fishing is just real typical. We've got just kind of a big sand flat. We've got some cabbage weeds. And then if we just go another, you know, 70 yards that way, it drops off into some deeper water. And 
we're just focusing on the stands of cabbage and getting that slip bobber up there, let it kind of move right among the cabbage and these fish are just coming out and ambushing it. And it's just been a fun way to catch fish and beautiful, beautiful night on the water. You know, one of the big things that's changed in fishing is just the spot lock features on these trolling motors. I mean, I remember where we were using a lot of anchors and we were using the biggest anchor that we could lift. We would put chain on it just, you know, for really windy days where we could hold the boat. And when the spot lock first came out, it was useful, but it wasn't really tight enough where I would feel comfortable using slip bobbers with it, especially in strong wind. The spot lock, the orientation on the spot lock has just gotten better and better where now, I mean, I don't even carry an anchor in my boat anymore. I'm not even worrying about, you know, lifting an anchor up out of the, pulling it out of the mud and lowering it back down. I used to have a big tub that would put my anchor in so I wouldn't get mud in the bottom of the boat. Those days are gone, luckily. And because these spot locks have gotten so tight, they've become really useful, valuable tools for things like slip bobbers. You know, to take it even a step further with these, with these trolling motors today, I'm using a 36 volt Ultrex I love it because of the cable steering and plus I still have the remote, but I'm using three lithium batteries. And so I'm using the Dakota 100 series lithiums and tell you what, I don't care if there's three foot waves, four foot waves, you can spot lock on a spot for 10, 11 hours. You don't ever have to worry about budging. I mean, you just do not, you just cannot wear out the batteries in a day. And so when you combine the spot lock features with the lithium, it doesn't matter how strong the current is, it doesn't matter how hard the wind's blowing. It's the easiest boat control in the world. You just sit on a good spot and fish. Got him. Ooh, nice fish. Yeah, it is. Just love it how these bobbers just dunk. Oh, come on up. This is a good fish. Yeah, I, I caught a glimpse of him. Ooh, it's oh, a yeah. dandy. These fish are just beautiful. There we go. Oh, thank nice you, sir. Nice fish. All right. Look at just how gold they are. That's just gorgeous. Beautiful color fish here. There, there she goes. All right, get the slip bobber out of here. <laughs> let's do it again. Yeah, let's do it again is right. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was kind of unique out there today was the fact that as we were scanning and uh, moving along and you know using the electronics, we could see stands of cabbage weed. And a lot of that weed was only two and three feet tall, which tells me it's, it's gonna be coming up in the next few weeks and it's gonna be getting taller. But I think it's because we had such a mild winter this year and we didn't have a lot of snowfall. So light was able to penetrate a lot of these lakes, you know, all winter long. Because what we were finding in some areas was actually stalks of cabbage or maybe a, a, a small, spot with you know five six seven stalks of cabbage that was still four and five feet tall and it seemed like whenever we got near that taller cabbage the stuff that was you know left over from last year it seemed like the fish were really relating to that even more so than the new growth cabbage that will be coming up in the upcoming weeks you know there's a lot of way, different ways to fish this i know jason's got just a bare hook right now but one of the things i like to do is i like to use this little whistler jig and what it does is it has this little blade and with the whistler jig that little propeller really seems to you know has that flash has a little bit of vibration that seems to attract the fish but on a calm day you know unless you're going to drag it real slowly you're not going to get the effective action but on when the waves are like this i like to tie it on i just think it adds a little bit more a little bit more flash for the fish Bobber down. You can just see him take it down. Nice. You got one, Jay. How does he feel, Tony? Oh yeah, that's a nice fish. They let me move yeah, I think well. I'll grab the net. I don't think I wanna, I, think I wanna lift him up. That's a good fish there. All right, nice work. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow was right. Yeah, he just smoked it. Look at that, just a fat fish. Wow. It's your lucky day, buddy. There he goes. Never gets old. <laughs> 